So Hare Krishna devotees, welcome to day 15. We're almost at the end of the 18-day session uh, for this 18-day um, program of the 18 chapters of the Bhagavad Gita. <clears throat> so today's chapter called Purushottama Yoga uh, is again a very short chapter like chapter 12. We have only 20 shlokas in this 15th chapter. So it would be appropriate for us to actually take a quick review of chapter 14. We said that out of the 700 verses in the Bhagavad Gita, 100 verses are devoted to the topic of the three gunas, um, which is Sattvagun, Rajagun, and Tamagun. And <clears throat> The word guna means rope, and these ropes, the three different ropes, and the combination of the three different ropes for each of us, um, it tends to bind us to our material existence. So the first instruction Krishna gives is that all of us must elevate ourselves to the sattvagun, which is if we are in tamogun or if we are predominantly under the influence of Rajagun, Krishna is saying, first of all, bring yourself uh, to the mode of <clears throat> goodness. But at the end of this chapter, in the 14th chapter, the Lord also says that we must also try to go beyond the mode of goodness to the state of pure goodness, which is called the Shuddha Sattva state. In that state, one offers everything to Krishna and therefore there is no more karmic reactions for you when you willingly not only work for Krishna but also do everything for his pleasure. So once you remain in this Shuddha Sattva state, which is in a state where you are always connected to Krishna, um, then one can go back to the spiritual world. <clears throat> Krishna talks about how these different modes of nature, the Satvagun, Rajagun, and Tamagun, influence various aspects of our life. The way in which we behave, uh, the kind of foods that we are attracted to, our philosophy of life, um, it also influences much more what may seem like inconsequential things like uh, you know, your sleep habits, your work habits, your recreation habits. So if you say recreation, you know, like reading books or engaging in sports or listening to music <clears throat> or going on vacation, what is your taste in all of these things? So these things may seem inconsequential to us, but in reality, it is constantly shaping our character, our behavior, and our overall approach to life. And therefore, these three gunas, over a period of time, impact us physically, mentally, and emotionally. It makes you who you are, specifically when we say who you are, your identification with this particular body. And if you recall, Krishna talks about the state of mind for such a person under the influence of three gunas. The one in Sattva Guna is always in a happy state. The one in Raja Guna is always agitated because he's always looking for something. He feels like something is always missing in his life. Something that is always missing, meaning something that is some material that is missing in his life. And the 
the state of mind of a person who is under the influence of the mode of darkness or tamo tamo that person tends to be lazy dull uh maybe even subject to madness and then krishna talks about what happens to people who are under the influence of these three modes where do they go after they die <clears throat> typically people who are in the sattva gun state they would have accumulated a lot of punya so naturally they will go to the higher planetary systems to enjoy themselves with longer lives and more wealth and more of everything whereas those who are in rajagun if they are still attached to a lot of material desires uh then they have to take birth again to fulfill those material desires in the pla middle planetary systems like the earth and for those who die predominantly under the mode of ignorance krishna says either they will go into lower species of life which means they may not get a human form in the next life or it's also possible that they will be sent to the hellish planets to suffer for whatever activities that they have committed not that in not just in the present life but also in their past life and krishna says if you are under the influence of sattva gun you have access to knowledge you are on the platform of knowledge if you are under the influence of rajagun you are predominantly driven by greed and uh, for those in tamogun it's just madness or illusion krishna also talks about the results of activities under each of these three gunas so all of your activities uh, the results will be pure if you are under the influence of sattva if you are under the influence of rajagun the results will be more and more misery misery means you will experience more duality because you are constantly chasing things in a world that is impermanent in a body that is impermanent and the result of activities for those under the influence of tamogun is uh, krishna says foolishness so and then krishna talks about uh first of all he tells us we should transcend these three modes also so if you are on tamogun or rajagun first try to come to sattva because sattva gun gives you access to knowledge and from there it sets up a good platform for you to uh go to the pure goodness state which is the vishuddha sattva vishuddha sattva state so the symptoms krishna's coming back again to the symptoms of a person uh who has transcended the mode of goodness such a person krishna says they are equipoised they are neutral they are free from hankering they are free from envy they see everybody equally um uh, whether you praise him or blame him he does not get overjoyed or agitated you can honor him or dishonor him it does not make a difference to him um so not only does he remain steady in all circumstances he also deals equally with everyone and everything so in that everything example krishna compares the earth and the stone and the piece of gold all of them are seen by the person who has transcended these three gunas as just energies of the lord so they have not attributed value so only when you are driven by greed do you tend to attribute value to material things right gold is more precious than maybe an ordinary stone and an ordinary stone may be a little bit more precious than the earth earth meaning 
the soil. So not only does he see everything with equal vision, he also sees everyone with equal vision. So no such thing as friend, enemy in this person's mind. And Krishna also says, what about the activities of a, such a person? Krishna says they are very thoughtful before they act. They don't act whimsically. Why? Because they surrender to Krishna and they are very determined in pursuing the spiritual journey that they've undertaken. And this is how they become free from the modes. So you will notice that so far in almost every chapter, Krishna has talked about the importance of knowledge. That we should take shelter of real knowledge. <clears throat> and um, knowledge can open doors for you. Knowledge can lead you to greater conviction. So if you look at the middle six chapters, Krishna has said, have faith in me, surrender to me, always remember me, never forget me. But in case you are not ready to do that, then the last six chapters focus on knowledge because some people need a lot more convincing than others. They have a lot of doubts that needs to be rooted out from them, from their consciousness. So it's although bhakti yoga is simple and easy to practice, it is so simple and it is so easy that nobody takes it up. Because anything that is simple and easy, you become a little suspicious of because we are living in a, such an age where if you don't struggle for something, maybe that particular path is not that valuable. Unfortunately, the human mind works in this way, specifically in the Kali Yoga. So let's say you're not ready to become a bhakta. Then Krishna focuses the last few chapters on just giving you a lot more theoretical knowledge uh, with the hopes and expectation that some of your doubts may get cleared up. So for example, if you're told, <clears throat> some people, if they're told, if you just chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Some of us will take it seriously and start chanting. Uh, so we don't have to comprehend how this process works. We just have to remember the instruction and follow the instruction and that in itself is actually beneficial for us. So when we remember the instruction of an acharya and begin to follow it with faith, it also produces results. So Krishna says at the end of the Bhagavad Gita that those who take the shelter of this knowledge that he is giving specifically in the Bhagavad Gita, that they are also worshipping him, but they are worshipping him with their intelligence. So philosophy is actually an integral part of bhakti, but one does not necessarily need to fully comprehend philosophy before one can actually pursue the path of bhakti. In order to pursue the path of bhakti, one only needs a little bit of faith, shraddha. That's all that is required. A little bit of faith that a pure devotee is telling you to do something. And if you follow the instructions, um, then your life is going to get transformed. So, <clears throat> since the last section of the Bhagavad Gita is about prakriti, and in this particular chapter, Krishna again talks about how he is the seed giving father of all that exists. So if he is the father, then the womb in which uh, we have developed is actually Prakriti and Prakriti is our mother. 
which means every jivatma has a spiritual side and also has a material side they are originally spiritual beings and we will always be spiritual beings but when we come in contact with mother in the form of material nature then we also have a material side to us so on the spiritual side we have to remember that we are part and parcel of krishna but because we are living in this material world we also have some material tendencies and features so essentially this chapter 14 focuses on how prakriti and traps us and tricks us to stay here in this material world um and then krishna also gives us the solution of how to avoid this entrapment and how to be elevated in our consciousness so that we can exit from this prison house so in this prison house we said there are three bars the three bars are the sattva gun raja gun and tamo gun you could say that if you're predominantly under the influence of sattva gun you're in a better better jail cell than somebody under the influence of tamo gun so it's just the quality of the jail that you experience differs from person to person based on their past karmic reactions so some of us have a really easy life some of us have extremely difficult lives most of us fall into the category of mixed plus and minus so <clears throat> krishna has said even sattva gun causes you to become complacent and comfortable so you don't search for any higher truth so these three modes the sattva gun and raja gun and tamo gun are so subtle that your consciousness gets influenced so it's the interaction between matter and consciousness so this is something we have to remember and i remember one of the preachers using this phrase that the modes of nature determine our moods so they influence our attitude towards everything so for example the solution that the lord is giving at the end in chapter 14 one is of self discipline the second one is of self discovery self discipline means uh if you have a car you have to learn how to drive the car the best that you can and that requires a little bit of training and also access to a good instructor but self discipline alone will not get you back to the spiritual world only if it is followed by self discovery right that is why it's called self realization the path of self discovery so if self discipline means learning how to drive the car the best that we can it's a skill self discovery means what kind of car am i driving which means is this car in the mode of goodness is this car in the mode of uh passion or ignorance or is it a combination do i know what kind of car i am driving am i driving a mercedes benz or am i driving a maruti alto so self discipline is what we nurture in us self discovery is understanding our own nature and learning to manage this nature the best we can
Therefore, self-discipline alone will not work. Every one of us have to, at some point or the other, undertake the path of self-discipline. To understand what kind of mind you have, what kind of body you have. How can you make it work best for you? Krishna says, Yantra Rudani Mayaya. This yantra, this body of yours. Ah. It's a machine. You have to learn how to operate the machine, but then you also need to know what kind of machine it is. So, this is a critical aspect of this uh, chapter 14. Um, and to, to further talk about the three modes, those under the mode of goodness typically tend to think before they act. Those in the mode of passion act and then ask questions. Why? Why did it happen? So one is uh, reflection before acting. The other one is acting and then reflecting. Why did I do that? Or what happened? Whereas in the mode of ignorance, neither is there. There is no thinking and also there is no acting for a purpose. There is no purpose-driven action there. It's just completely illusion. And therefore Krishna says the mode of goodness is illuminating. Uh, Krishna also talks about how these three modes interact with each other and how they influence you. And Krishna also says that we have to understand that the soul is not the doer, neither is the super soul. So what does that mean? It simply means we are forced to do things as we choose to desire. So it's your desire that is um, causing certain activities to be triggered and certain results to be triggered as a result of that. And then Arjuna asks those three questions. Um, what are the characteristics of one who has transcended these three modes? What is his behavior? And then Arjuna asks, well, how can I, how did they transcend the three modes? And that is how the chapter actually concludes with Krishna talking about how you can actually go beyond the three modes. So let's look at the concluding uh, verses and then we will come to chapter 15. Chapter 15 is a short chapter. So how does one transcend the three modes to get to the pure state of goodness? One who engages in full devotional service, unfailing in all circumstances, at once transcends the modes of material nature and thus comes to the level of Brahman. And Krishna says, and I am the basis of the impersonal Brahman, which is immortal, imperishable, and eternal, and is the constitutional position of ultimate happiness. So that brings us to the short chapter called Purushottama Yoga. Remember, in an earlier chapter, Krishna, uh, sorry, Arjuna has asked, what is Prakriti? What is Purusha? What is Jnana? What is Jnana? What is Kshetra? What is Kshetra Jnana? Krishna has answered the question Prakriti in very detail in chapter 14. Krishna is going to focus on Purusha in this particular chapter. So the single word summary for chapter 13 was Krishna as the Paramatma. As an attorney, he is ready to help you. And in the chapter that we covered yesterday, 
what is actually stopping you from getting out of prison is the three bars, the three gunas. And today's chapter, Purushottama. Uttama means topmost. Purusha means enjoy. Who is the topmost enjoyer? The Lord says he is the topmost enjoyer. So if you do not have a faith in Krishna, but you have faith in scriptures and knowledge, remember that the last six chapters are Jnana Yoga. So if you have faith in knowledge, but you don't have faith in Krishna, you're not ready to practice Bhakti Yoga. Krishna says, you can use the Vedic scriptures as your global positioning system to get out of this prison house. So even if you don't have faith in the Supreme Lord, if you have faith in the Vedic scriptures, they become your escape plan. And this entire chapter focuses on how we have accepted to be true that which is not true. And Krishna will talk about what is the ultimate purpose of the Vedic scriptures. It is really to understand him. So Krishna says, don't get caught up in these various illusory traps. If you're focused on the object of the Vedic scriptures, which is to discover who is the Supreme Lord, then even if you just focus on following the Vedic scriptures, you can still escape this prison house. Um, so with that, let's look at chapter 15. Before we begin, let's offer our most humble obeisances to His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shri Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So, it's a short chapter, just 20 shlokas. The acronym for today's chapter is HOME. The choice for us is, do we want to go back home? Or do we want to stay in this hotel? Although it is a prison house, we think it's a fantastic five-star hotel. We don't want to let go. We don't want to pay our bills and exit. We just want to continue to stay in this hotel. Krishna is saying this hotel is temporary. It's better you come back home. And he's going to describe how suffocating this hotel is. And that's the illusion. So what are the options that Krishna is giving us? Again, he talks about the spiritual world. How he comes back to the theme of maintaining everything. How the Lord is maintaining everything for us. And the essence of the Vedic scriptures. I think the summary of the Vedanta is in today's chapter. <clears throat> so uh, let's look at the slides. I think most of the shlokas are on the slides. So the question is, do you want to go home? You want to stay in this hotel, hotel being this prison. So the entire chapter begins with the Lord using an analogy of an upside down banyan tree. So let's look at the shloka. Shri Bhagavan Vacha Urdhva Moolama Dakshakam Ashvatham Prahuravyayam Chandam Siyasya Parnani Yastam Veda Saveda Vita The Supreme Personality of God had said, It is said that there is an imperishable banyan tree that has its roots upwards and its branches down and whose leaves are the Vedic hymns. One who knows this tree is the knower of the Vedas. So <clears throat> here Krishna is saying, you look at this uh, picture, there is a tree and then there is a reflection of the tree in the water. Krishna is saying, the real tree is the spiritual world and the reflection of the tree is like the material world and the jivatma 
the fruit is actually on the real tree. The reflection of the fruit on the tree is in the water. And the Jeevatma is endlessly trying to chase and get that fruit that is in the water, not realizing that that fruit is just not a real thing because it's just a reflection. The real fruit, the real taste, the real happiness, the real bliss actually exists in the spiritual world. Krishna is saying, if you know this, that your real happiness, the place that you will be happiest will be when you go back to Krishna. Here, when you are in this material world, Krishna is saying, you are preoccupied with everything that is illusory because everything is going to get destroyed. Your body is going to be gone. Your family is going to be gone. Your property is going to be gone. You have to give up everything when you leave. So Krishna is saying, if you understand this truth, then you will not be preoccupied with that reflection in the water. You will find the real source of the tree and you will go in the opposite direction. So how do we free ourselves from this reflection? The first thing is you need to understand who you are, that you are not this body, that you are eternally a spirit soul. How do you detach yourself from this false identity? Very simple, by attaching yourself to Krishna. You will develop uh, a sense of your real identity. Your real identity will become revealed to you through your attachment to Krishna. And of course, that also means you have to give up your attachment to everything that is there in this material nature. You shouldn't think that everything belongs to me. So give up that sense of I own and I control. We don't own anything and we don't control anything. We are just pretending to own and pretending to control for a brief period of time and then we have to change body. But we keep repeating the cycle again and again. So Krishna is saying, don't be attracted by this reflection because there is no enjoyment in this reflection because the real fruit is not there. It's just a shadow. So Krishna talks about the options and the differences between the spiritual world and the material world. So in the spiritual world, Krishna says, Natad bhashayate suryo that eternal paramam here, transcendental abode, that supreme abode of mind is not illumined by the sun or the moon, nor by fire or electricity. Those who reach it never return to this material world. So if you climb up that upside down tree, and reach the roots and keep climbing, you will ultimately reach the spiritual world. And when you reach the spiritual world, you don't have to worry about coming back to the material world. Krishna is saying, in my abode, there is no sun, there is no moon, there is no fire, there is no electricity. Everything is illuminated by the, the effulgence coming from the Lord's body. And the spiritual world is much bigger than the material world. Three-fourths of everything that exists is actually the spiritual world. So the jail is just like a quarter piece where we are residing. Krishna says, Mamai Vamsho Jeeva Loke. He is taking ownership of you. He is saying, we are all eternally parts and parcels of him. It's just that we got separated from him. And when we got separated, we are lost. So Krishna is waiting for us to seek his help to come back to him. So if a child cries out for his father, the father will come immediately and pick him up. So similarly, Krishna expects you to cry out for him so that he will come and pick you up. 
but you have to recognize that he is your father. If you don't, well, what's the consequence? Then we are bound and then we have to keep transmigrating. The soul just keeps switching body after body after body. Mamai vamsho jiva loke jiva bhuta sanatanaha manashashthani indriyani prakritisthani karshati the living entities in this conditioned world are my eternal, fragmental parts. Krishna is saying we all originated in him. Due to conditioned life, they are struggling very hard with the six senses which include the mind. So your, your five gross senses plus your mind. Krishna is saying we are caught up in this illusion because of our senses being attracted to sense objects. Shariram yada vapnoti yachap utkramati shvaraha krihitvaitani sanyati vayur gandhani vashayat. The living entity in the material world carries his different conceptions of life from one body to another as the air carries aromas. Thus, he takes one kind of body, again quits it to take another. So what determines what kind of body you get in your next life? Krishna is saying your own conceptions, your own desires. Like the air will carry the aroma. So if the air is passing over a rose field, then it picks up the aroma of the rose field. If that same air is going over a garbage dump, it will pick up the noxious smells of the garbage dump. So if your consciousness is attached to the pure, then your next body is going to be determined by that level of purity. If your consciousness is very much attached to the impure, then your body is going to be determined by that level of impurity of consciousness. But Krishna is definitely saying, as long as you have these desires, as long as your consciousness is contaminated, you will take another body. So that's the challenge for us. And Krishna is explaining the living entity, thus taking another gross body, obtains a certain type of ear, eye, tongue, nose, and sense of touch, which are grouped about the mind. He thus enjoys a particular set of sense objects. So sometimes we may be in the body of a pig, in the body of an elephant, in the body of a bee. Krishna is saying all this, that the kind of ear you get, kind of eyes you get, all of this is determined by your own desires. The foolish, Krishna says, cannot understand how a living entity can quit his body, nor can they understand what sort of body he enjoys under the spell of the modes of nature. So Krishna is saying, only if you are foolish, you don't understand that when you die, you are going to take another body, nor are you going to understand what kind of body you are preparing yourself for in this life based under the influence of the three mothers. Therefore, Krishna concludes, but one whose eyes are trained in knowledge can see all of this. These are not physical eyes. Krishna is talking about the eye of wisdom. So once you've understood that this body is temporary, then you will detach yourself from this temporary by attaching yourself to the eternal, which is the Supreme Lord. Krishna comes back to the topic of how he maintains everything. Gama Vishya Bhutani Dhara Yami Aham Ojasa Ushnami Chaushadhi Sarvaha Somo Bhutvara Satmakaha. So now again, Krishna is going to explain how he keeps everything in order. Krishna says, I enter into each planet 
and by my energy they stay in orbit. Remember we discussed without Krishna, none of us can live. Even if the soul is occupying the body, if Paramatma is not within this cosmos, none of us can survive. Because Krishna is saying the planets are floating very nicely because I have entered each planetary system. It's because of my energy they stay in orbit. Not only that, I become the moon and thereby supply the juice of life to all vegetables. So the taste that we experience in vegetables and fruits, Krishna is saying that is because of the rays of the moon falling on these various plants and trees. So even the moon has a role to play in what we eat. The taste of everything in plant life is coming from moonlight. <clears throat> so Krishna is saying, he gives various examples of how he is maintaining all of our bodies here. Aditya Gatam Tejo, Krishna says, I am the splendor of the sun. Kam avishya cha bhutani. Krishna is saying he maintains all of the planets simply by entering them through his energy. Pushnami chaushadi sarva. He supplies the juice of life to all vegetables. Vaishva naro. Without Krishna being present as the fire inside your body to help you digest the foods, you will not be alive. So Krishna is saying, he is the fire of digestion. Prana pana samayuktaha pachamyannam. And through this fire of digestion, Krishna says, all of the foods that you consume gets <clears throat> digested with the help of the outcoming, outgoing and incoming air. So you can see Krishna is maintaining our body. Krishna has given examples of that. Krishna is now going to give examples of how he is maintaining your mind and the soul. How? Sarvasya chaham kriti sannivishto matas mritir jnanam apohanam cha vedais cha sarvairaham eva vedyo vedanta krit veda vedeva chaham Krishna is saying, I am seated in everyone's heart and from me come remembrance, knowledge and forgetfulness. By all the Vedas, I am to be known. Indeed, I am the compiler of Vedanta and I am the knower of the Vedas. So how is Krishna maintaining your mind? It's because of Krishna, you are caused to remember something or you are caused to forget something. It's because of Krishna, you have some knowledge. And then, how does he maintain the jivatmas? Because the soul is actually eternal. Krishna is saying, once you've understood that you're eternal, Krishna says, by all the Vedas, I am the purpose of studying the Vedas. You have to get, you get to find out who I am. Not only Krishna is saying, by studying the Vedas, you'll discover who I am. Krishna says, you need to know, I have actually compiled the Vedas. So Vyasadev is considered to be a literary incarnation of Lord Vishnu. So Krishna is saying, indeed, I am the compiler of Vedanta and I am the knower of the Vedas. Krishna says, I am the object of Vedic scriptures. I have compiled the Vedic scriptures and I know the Vedic scriptures. <clears throat> so it's through the Vedic scriptures that we begin to understand how we need to maintain the soul, which is to go beyond just thinking about how do I maintain this body? How do I make my mind happy, peaceful, anxiety free? But we also have to look at maintaining one soul through the scriptures. So the essence of all the Vedanta is in 16, 17, and 18. As Krishna has talked about Vedic scriptures 
and that he is the compiler of Vedanta. Now he is going to talk about the essence of the Buddha. Dvavimau Puru Shauloke Sharas Chakshara Evacha Sharas Sarvani Bhutani Bhutas Thokshara Uchate. Krishna is saying the summary of all Vedic scriptures. There are two classes of beings, the fallible and the infallible. In the material world, every living entity is fallible. And in the spiritual world, every living entity is called infallible. So Krishna is saying there are only two kinds of jivatmas, human beings. Those who are perfect, they are there in the spiritual world. Those who are imperfect, they are there in the material world. So only two categories of human beings. Perfect and imperfect. If you are imperfect, you are living here in the material space. If you are perfect, you are not here. You are in the spiritual world. So two categories of living entities. Fallible and infallible. What does the fallible do? They want to be separate from Krishna because they want to quote unquote enjoy their independence. They are always therefore residing in the material world. What about the infallible? Like the Gopa boys here. They always want to be with Krishna. And because they always want to be with Krishna, they are never tempted by anything illusory. And therefore they never leave the spiritual. They are always eternally living there. So they are called the Nitya Siddhas. The perfect beings. And we in this material con uh, world are called the Nitya Bhattas. Uh, because we are overcome by illusion. Uttamah Purushastvanyah Paramatmetu Dhahritaha Yolo Katrayam Avishya Bhibatya Vyaya Ishvaraha So, besides these two, besides which two? The fallible and the infallible. Two kinds of jivatmas. Krishna is saying, besides these two, there is the greatest living personality, the supreme soul, the imperishable Lord himself, who has entered the three worlds as in, and is maintaining them. So, Krishna is referring to himself in this particular shloka as Vishnu. It's Vishnu who enters all the cosmos and maintains them. So there is the fallible in the living entity, there is the infallible living entity, and then there is this Paramatma. From Mahavishnu to Garbhodakshai Vishnu to Kshirodakshai Vishnu. They pervade the entire universe. And then Krishna talks about himself. So beyond Paramatma, there is one more personality. That's the Supreme Lord. Yasmat Ksharam Atita Atito Ham Aksharadapi Chottamaha Atosmi Loke Vedecha Prathitta Purushottamaha Krishna is saying, because I am transcendental, beyond both the fallible and the infallible. And because I am the greatest, I am celebrated both in the world and in the Vedas as that supreme person. Purushottama. Person means somebody who has form. Krishna is referencing to himself as someone who is even beyond that Parma. So Krishna is saying, therefore, I am the goal that you need to pursue. Then, let's look at how the chapter ends here. The last two shlokas. Krishna talks, Whoever knows me as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, without doubting, is the door of everything. He therefore engages himself in full devotional service to me 
O son of Bharata. This is the most confidential part of the Vedic scriptures, O sinless one. And it is disclosed now by me. Whoever understands this will become wise and his endeavors will know perfection. So Krishna is concluding by saying, ah, anybody who understands that I am the Supreme Personality of God, they don't have doubt. They have faith. Krishna says they know everything. Because they have faith, what do they do? They surrender and start worshipping. They engage themselves in devotion service. And Krishna says this is the most confidential part of the Vedic scriptures. That whoever understands this confidential knowledge, they will become wise and all of their endeavors, Krishna says, will know perfection. So that's the essence of today's chapter, which is, which is the 20 shlokas that we covered. Essentially, that Krishna is saying, all of us should understand that we are in this prison house. We are not in a hotel where we can get to stay forever. And each of us must endeavor to get out of this prison house and go back to our real home. And our real home is in the spiritual world where, where all the other jivatmas, the Nitya Siddhas, are there constantly enjoying themselves with Krishna. So in the future chapters, you will discover how Krishna can help you check out of this hotel. So join us to understand this and uh, we will cover the 16th chapter tomorrow and see where the rest of the journey takes us.